Welcome to Launch Codes, the podcast about marketing operations, artificial intelligence, and more. Each week, you'll hear from experts as they share insights, stories, and strategies. Welcome to Episode 8. I'm your host, Joe Peters. On today's episode, Google sharpens their focus on image trust issues. Nightshade poisons AI image recognition. We have a community question about LinkedIn connections and the connection between career critics. And then we have some hot takes on new Ray-Ban smart glasses, the Brits letting their royal guard down on cybersecurity, and Marketo writing a new chapter for their program reference library. Today I'm joined by Matt Tonkin. Happy Halloween, Matt. Happy Halloween, Joe. What are you excited to discuss this week? So from just a pure pun value, the nightshade poisons AI, I think, uh, <laughs> you know, that really hit it out of the park for me. But uh, <laughs> uh, just from uh, being a glasses wearer myself, I think I, I want to hear about this Ray-Ban smart glasses and see see how much better my life can be or, or not be. <laughs> Well, I, I I hear that, uh, well, there's like two phases of this, but let's not scoop that segment. We'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> okay, so our first topic today is about a 2023 pointer study that revealed that 70% of people are not confident in their ability to tell when online images are authentic and reliable. And so Google is offering three new ways to check images and sources online. One, it allows you to fact check this image. So that gives you history of the image and how websites use it. Okay. Second, it has a fact check explorer, which gives gur- journalists and fact checkers a way to learn about the image or topic. And then finally, this search generative explorer, which gives AI summarized descriptions of sources. So Matt, I think you know we're in this new era of content validation and the challenge of deep fakes what do you think this means for brands and what do you think it means for a broader society yeah well first off i'm actually somewhat impressed that 70 70 percent of people are are not confident <laughs> and admit that, right like that to me is that's something that people are understanding like yes i'm bad at this i think uh one thing though that jumps out to me is this is 70% saying that when they're being polled and specifically asked about that, how, how many are actively thinking about that while they're scrolling through, you know, right, social media. right. From, from a brand's perspective, I mean, there's a few good things, right? Like I think, um, imagine brands looking for stock images for their, um, you know, products and stuff and wanting to, you know, not use maybe something that's just generic and AI generated, um, that yeah. gives them an option to see, you know, where is this actually coming from if we're just buying it from, you know, a stock image place. Um, I think having that, there's a lot of ability to sort of, you know, take more control in what you're using um, and have that. Again, you're just trusting what Google's providing, so it's not always going to be perfect, but yeah. there's a bit more source there. Um, well, I, I think one of the things that I worry about for brands are, kind of misappropriation of the brand. So I think back to one of those first mid-journey, mind-blowing right. images where the Pope was in like a Balenciaga-inspired parka. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think there are some things that could be on the negative side of brands and so quickly and easily generated. Now, obviously, there are content guardrails on some of these systems for generating imagery but obviously there's going to be ways to defeat that or ways to manipulate it so i really feel like we're gonna have a real challenge now in ensuring that this is an authentic experience uh an image that we're Mm -hmm. uh, consuming And, and i think our default question for ourselves has to be hey Is this image real or not? Every time we're looking at something that kind of piques our interest and and questions like, oh, wow, this is pretty crazy stuff. And then is that real or not? My my go to when I'm talking with, you know, friends and family about this or anything you see online, whether it's about AI generation or not, is if it makes you have an emotional response, good or bad, think about why you're having that response and 
and always go with the assumption that everything's fake. But it's yeah. funny when you when you mentioned you know brands and and how they're being represented. Uh, what triggered for me, and I think any uh, Canadian of a certain generation will have this uh, memory is um, the house hippo, which if you don't know about the North American house hippo, uh, it was a PSA back. I, I can't remember exactly when it was running, but it's done up like a animal planet discovery channel, um, animal documentary. Right. And it's this little hippo that's running around a house building nests out of lint and, and all this stuff. And it looks really real. Um, and essentially the takeaway at the end of the commercial is that, you know, this looked really real, right? But you knew it wasn't. So you need to be careful about what you're seeing on TV and understand that it's not always real. And I think this is sort of leading us towards like, what's this generation's house hippo? How do we, how do we put it in the back of people's minds? Like be aware of, you know, how these are being made, be aware of what might, you know, be faults for some sort of agenda or something like that, or just in general. Yeah. I, I think I've never, I've actually never heard of the house hippo. So that's what new one Joe, me. I, I, I guess there, maybe there is a, I, no, I won't, I won't say there's a generation. <laughs> I won't say there's a generation. But I knew where you were going. For a second. <laughs> Um, never, okay, um, and yourself and anyone else, go, just go type House Hippo into Google and, and it'll come up because you, <laughs> you really need to experience it. That's hilarious. Okay. Well, I, I think when when I start to see the challenges that we're going to be facing, like so we're seeing a lot of things happening in kind of the Middle East right now with uh, the Israel-Palestine conflict with you know, what is a real image? What is not? What was from a previous time? All that fact checking mm. is is super, super concerning. You saw that fake Tucker Carlson segment uh, with Elon Musk. I, I think we're in for a real nightmare moving into, I'm going to say, election season, mm. not only in the US, but also uh, Canadian elections coming up with being able to determine quick uh, it, it, in relatively quick order um how to stop fake content from yeah. i'm going to say poisoning uh the minds of the electorate and i think i actually don't know how we're going to combat this that's that's a great point because if you think about those three offerings they all still feel like a there needs to be a bit of time for those to be figured out right like about this image, um, even if it's being done really quickly or, or fact checking, there's a time, right? And that time is longer than it takes for a post to be put on TikTok or Facebook or Instagram, right? So yeah. it doesn't matter if you can fact check it after the fact and say, oh, yeah, no, this is wrong because everyone already saw it and they don't care. Exactly. If there's a million views before it's fact checked, or this presupposes that someone wants to fact check, right? Mm. You're just scrolling through your X feed. And seeing things, who knows, right? Who knows what you're consuming and whether it's real or not. So I think we're in for a bit of the Wild West in terms of um, manipulation and uh, and deep fakes taking hold. And um, we're going to collectively as a society have to just question almost everything that we're consuming. And I think your th your, your idea of, if I have an emotional response or trigger for this, I need to understand if this is real, right? Yep. Well, let's let's move along to our second topic here on uh, your your favorite topic, uh, <laughs> especially for with Halloween uh, coming up, is uh, artists using nightshade to derail AI image recognition. So. This new tool is enabling artists to protect their work from being scraped into AI training sets. And it manipulates images at the pixel level. And once enough distorted images are used to train AI, the entire model starts to break down and misread images. So for example, Stable Diffusion started misinterpreting the prompt for dog just after 50 images. And... Um, I think this is helpful and a tool for artists to mask their own personal style, but it could take hundreds of thousands of po poisoned images 
to really create the hallucinations that we're looking for or they want to achieve depending on the size of the AI model. So what do you think about this new battleground for protecting artistic uh, copyright? The funny thing is, I'm not sure it's a new battleground. It's new in the sense of against AI, but right, this isn't this isn't anything different than what we've seen for years. Think back to um, artists trying to prevent, you know, peer to peer sharing of songs and that sort of thing, and how, you know, yes, uh, Napster went away, but then LimeWire <laughs> and a hundred others pop up. And I think anytime you are you're developing tools to prevent something you're already behind, right? You're playing catch up because as soon as you develop Great something point. to block it, and I mean the solution, at least, well, not solution, but you really didn't see that first drop off in piracy until iTunes or, or Netflix, um, right? Where you're giving a legal way to get what people want because they'll get it. So so I don't know if there is that sort of um, parody, but I think even now you're seeing uh, piracy start to trend up again because you know there's 30 streaming platforms and I don't know which ones I want so I just want what I want to watch simply um, right. and that's the same thing here I just want to produce this image simply and somehow you're going to get it done um, so it's it's interesting I think it's a cool tool but you're I think you're always fighting an uphill battle if you're trying to prevent something yeah I think I think you're right there about the uphill battle and where I see you know, the process that these scraping mechanisms are going to sort of create their own next uh, salvo of or volley of uh, of shots in this battle is they're going to scan to check before ingestion. And, and then it kind of defeats this. So I, I do... I do like the conversation that this is starting and I do feel like this is a short term part of the, of this battle for copyright uh, protection, but I think it's going to be an uphill battle. And I think uh, they're going to have a lot of trouble mm -hmm. being able to uh, stop, uh, accomplish what they're trying to accomplish, yeah. which is the protection of their, their images. Yeah. I think, you're right. There needs to be, you're not going to win the battle, I don't think. So there, it needs to be more collaborative in how you do that. Yeah. And I think photographs and digital art are going to be challenges to maintain artistic copyright. And you're, it's almost like we're going to go old school a little bit. Uh, painting is going to be, have a resurgence because that's something that you're going to be able to, you can, it's a tangible. Assume maintain some um uh protection on but yeah. that's a topic for uh another another yeah another day all right i love this community question we have today and really really interesting and and to be honest as an employer I, i've never come across this as a process that we would necessarily use but do you have the question is do you have any experience with a potential new employer seeking feedback from a mutual connection on LinkedIn without your consent? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting one because yeah, it doesn't it doesn't shock me. Um and I think I know myself personally um I'm if I'm interviewing someone, I'm I'm going to go on LinkedIn and look them up. So I think if you see that you have a mutual connection it would naturally be sort of the first on your mind is like, oh, I, I can actually hear from someone else what this person's like if they're if what their resume says is an accurate representation of what they're doing. So it seems sort of logical and kind of the the part of LinkedIn. What I'd say is, you know, that doesn't have to be a one way street. Um, I know when I was uh, coming here, Joe, I I reached out to a former consultant uh, from RP and I asked him, you know, what's it like here? So I think, yeah. I think it's a tool that can go both ways. Um, I definitely don't think it would be, you know, out of, out of, um, out of reason. Um, you need to think about like who you have on your LinkedIn and you can see that too. You can, you can go through, you will have an idea, I think, of who is going to be interviewing you, who would be your manager if you're doing the research. Uh, and you can see, do I have mutual connections with them? Is that mutual connection someone I want to 
um, have with them and, and maybe take some preemptive steps before you start <laughs> the process, right? Um, well, I, I think that that is probably the only solution. No. If you think someone from your, you may have to do a scan of your connections and just decide, hey, maybe Bob, um, yeah, Bob didn't like that I got the promotion over over him, and uh, maybe he has a bit of an axe to grind, and maybe I shouldn't be connected with Bob anymore. I I don't know, Matt. Like that's that's yeah, it's gonna it, be a bit of a challenge. I mean, it's tough because the whole concept of LinkedIn is you want to expand your network and expand your network. So I, you probably never think of it like, is this a good person to have in here? Like, is this someone who's going to give me good feedback if we have mutual connections? Um, yeah, I definitely think why. Well, and I know personally being in like the Marketo world, uh, there's always everyone knows everyone. Um, so Right. It's changed a bit in RevOps in general. And I don't think that's industry specific. It, it's probably true of a lot of industries where there's tight knit networks and everyone knows everyone. So you kind of do have to have that rapport with people. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. This is a, this is a hard one, but it's a reality and it's kind of like probably taking a little shot at the reference check process, mm -hmm. knowing that you're generally not going to give references that aren't going to give you a good reference. Yeah. Right. And if you have, then that's a little odd, but, uh, this <laughs> is, this is a, a approach of sort of checking that reference check process with, with connections and relationships, which I think is, which mm -hmm. is a natural part of this. So, and I think, I mean, the good news is if, if, you have good relationships and, and you have people on your LinkedIn that your work really spoke to them and they can talk well for you. I think someone that you didn't provide is going to be a much better reference than someone you did provide just because of what you said. Um, if I reached out to, if I'm hiring someone and I reached out to a connection of theirs and they said, this person is great, they're great at their job, great to work with. I'm taking that a lot more seriously than, you know, the names that the three names I get and a piece of paper at the resume. Yeah, I think you're right, Matt. I think you're right. So it's a little bit of a reality check and this is just where we're at for our community member here. But, uh, anyway, I think is, it's, I think it'd be frowned upon if someone's going on your link or your Facebook and your Instagram and finding your like family and close friends and asking you about that. Um, that's definitely, going a step far but i think the purpose of linkedin is to curate a network that you get along with and you work well with yeah that that i think you're right although i do know that some employers are doing those thorough scans oh yeah of socials uh, with uh, new employees uh, and, and double checking everything there so Yes, what a what an interesting time we're in here, where uh, you don't really get to control the process, uh, either as an employer or as a, a, a potential employee. I mean, it goes both ways, so you just have to kind of look and ex I, I think you have to expect that this is going to happen. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move uh, on here. And first, I'd like to thank our friends at Knack for sponsoring today's episode. NAC is the no-code platform that allows you to build campaigns in minutes, get AI-powered translations in up to 75 languages in just minutes. Visit NAC.com to learn more. That's K-N-A-K.com. So now we'll shift into our hot takes uh, segment. We have some great ones here, Matt. And as uh, a glasses wear, I mean, I have contacts on now, but you... <laughs> You were I'm the same. Time. I switched back and forth, depending. <laughs> <on the day. laughs> but uh, these new Ray-Ban Meta smart glasses uh, have been introduced, and actually, a, a colleague of ours, Pierce, has a pair already. Uh, it has uh, five built-in microphones, captures audio, video, and still images. Has a 12 me megapixel camera and shoots up to uh, 60 seconds of 1080p video. It has good stabilization, so you don't get motion sick with the, you know, the head moving, taking the shot. Uh, you can live stream to Facebook or Instagram. 
So obviously it's tethered to your phone. And there's a voice assistant that allows you to listen to text, take hand-free photos and videos and send messages. So, uh, and then there's an AI augmented part coming in the future where you can kind of look at, I don't know, a monument or a building and ask it what it is. Oh, that's cool. So what do you, what do you think about this? I think privacy, it's another new era, uh, part of the era of declining privacy with pretty much every single day we go out into the world. Yep. So it's funny what hop, what jumped out to me when I was thinking about this, cause I'm like thinking, oh, this is cool. Like I just replaced these. Um, but if you remember the last time I was on the podcast, we talked about the pendant that records everything as you go around. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, and I can say this, I felt a lot more hesitant about that pendant. Like I could feel that emotionally I responded different to this. And I don't know why, because there's a lot of similarities, right? I mean, there's more video being captured. There's video being captured, not just audio. Um, so I'm wondering if that's just a brand recognition thing. And I mean, I'm wearing Ray-Ban, so it's probably partly mental there right um but you're that that privacy thing um we're going around and you're taking video so out in public um people are now being captured and i mean that's true anyone on their phone could just be taking videos of anyone out there um but i think it's different when there's sort of that visual uh visual indicator that okay someone's got their phone out that they could be taking video versus someone just wearing glasses so that's you know, that's an interesting uh, thing. I'm not I'm not sure how I feel about that. Yeah. I, I, it, there's so many layers to this. I actually think there's a bit of risk for Ray-Ban at this point in doing this. It, there could be a bit of a backlash. You could see it. Oh, that guy's wearing uh, Ray-Bans. Right. A bit creepy. Uh, oh, great. <laughs> I got to change my glasses. Well, well, those are the sunglasses. I know, I know. They're also sunglasses. Oh, there's right. Okay, okay. I'm pretty sure they're sunglasses, but I might be wrong. uh, But I'm pretty sure they are. But I think where I find this interesting is we're 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 getting into this period where we're going to start to see augmentation of our capacity and abilities, and I think this is just another step forward in that in terms of the integrated or add on, um, to ourselves by technology and augmenting ourselves in, in different ways. And I, you know, this isn't the merge between, you know, where we're having AI, uh, connected right into our, into our brains, yeah. but, but there, there is a path along here a little bit. That's, that's stirring for us to, to see. And, um, you know, you could see that there would be some it's are there competitive advantages that you could have with this type of um this type well even of uh, imagine just traveling joe um you don't need to have great understanding of different languages anymore if if just in your field of vision signs are being translated um if yeah. you know you can take in what someone's saying and immediately have an english translation or, or whatever language translation right there's suddenly suddenly a whole new world literally opens up for you that you, you didn't have there. So just simple, simple day to day things that don't even get that far out of reality right now. I mean, I can do that with my phone and hold up to a sign and it'll translate. So it's that progressive steps that, yeah, what, what's going to be, what are these classes going to be doing in five years? Yeah, I think you're right. Like imagine you're walking around, you're trying uh, some old city that's a maze, let's say Barcelona or yeah, you know, where am I? And, and you have your sunglasses on and, and it's kind of saying, oh, to get back to your hotel, you take these mm. types of, you take this route and you're navigating the, uh, the maze of alleys and, and being able to find uh, your final destination. So I think this is, we're just in the early days here and I, you can only imagine there's going to be a period not too far in our future where this is table stakes and every everybody's going to have this in some form. Mm-hmm. But all right, that was a bit longer uh, than just a long thought on that one. I, yeah, <laughs> that got us that got us fired up. 
So this next one is around cybersecurity. So one third of Brits admit they're, they've given up following cybersecurity best practices. Yeah. Uh, so new research from Thales of over 2,000 UK city and citizens found an alarming level of consumer apathy when it came to keeping themselves safe online. This apathy is closely tied to feelings of confusion, futility, and information overload. So 51% struggle to grasp rapid advancements in technology and the implications on their own personal security. 22% admitted they had no clue about the significance of where in the world their data is stored. Uh, China, Russia, US, uh, wherever. 47% confessed to signing T and C's without a thorough reading. I think oh, that's a that's a lie. That's a, that's a <laughs> lie. That's a straight. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm moderately cybersecurity com- uh, um you know, conscious, I would say, and I, I'm so guilty of this. So, yeah. And 56 admitted they always accept cookies on websites due to it being an easy process or an easier process for as them. A, so, as a digital marketer, that that's like yay, but no. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you know, it, this is tying back to our our last topic on privacy and. We're in an era where it's very, very difficult to be vigilant. Mm-hmm. We're continuously having our our personal information violated. How many times do we now get that email from some business where they they have to inform us that they've had a data breach in our information or passwords or even some more important information, whether it's... Um, uh, social insurance numbers or social security numbers. We're 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 experiencing this. I'm not going to say every day, but probably weekly mm-hmm. and monthly at the bare minimum, where there's some infringement on our personal information. And it's so. I think it's so commonplace to your point, like that it's happening all the time, and a lot of younger generations who are, you know in the working world now that that's been their whole life is you know just clicking i I accept these terms and um going through that and even older generations it's been most of their life right where it's just sort of become static in the background and you okay what what's an easy password that sort of thing um not having like good practices around that password one (laughs) that sort of thing no it is It is hard to be vigilant and it is, uh, I mean, I think of just the inundated nature of a phone call, not like just being the spam that you get on through the phone now is unbelievable. Uh, so I think we're, you stay strong friends (laughs) is the message. Yeah, and you, and you and you have to keep on thinking about uh, what you can do to uh, to protect yourself, and what are some of uh, the. I, I feel really challenged for, uh, or feel really poorly for seniors today that mm. have low technological literacy and are being manipulated uh, all the time, right? And um, it's very very. Very, very tricky, and the AI is only going to get better and easier to do this. So we, we have to, we have to work together on trying to keep each other safe. All right, let's move on to our last hot take this week uh, from our friends at Marketo, and they've revamped the program reference library. And part of the September 2023 release, uh, there's a uh, allowing users to import example programs so uh whether that's uh, email engagement event scoring deliverability and operational programs uh, this is all part of the marketo revamped program reference library what are your thoughts on this matt yeah and and this has always been something that marketo's kind of had i think a lot of people don't realize that there's sort of these template programs that you can pull into marketo 
Um, maybe I'm a little jaded from my past experience with it, but I never felt that they were, you know, great. Um, but for, you know, a new user to Marketo, someone who doesn't have a lot of experience, they're, they're programs that are set up in a way that works, in a way that Marketo was structured to make use of. So it's great for getting your bearings on how these things could be structured. The problem is, is Marketo has to build these for every all of their customers, right? They have to be a single program that's going to work for manufacturing, for financial services, for SaaS companies. And what that means is they don't really work for any of them, at least not in a way that is beneficial um, if you have customizations that you need. So I really look at these as sort of a base building block and um, use them to understand, especially if you're new, but you're going to want to customize eventually, whether that's building onto these base programs or, you know, building these out and making programs that work for you. So it's great that they're, you know, trying to get a bit more of this user friendliness involved, I think. Um, but I think there's still room to go there. Yeah. Just more Lego in the Lego box that you can yeah. take and build with. Right. Yeah. Uh, in terms of, and I mean, the uh, benefit of Marketo is that it's completely customizable. Um, so having a cookie cutter program isn't why you get Marketo anyway. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move on to our pairing segment. So this week we have uh, a great album from Mavis Staples, uh, and it's a self-titled debut album from 1969. And so just for, for, for our, our listeners, we're putting the audio at the end of the podcast so you can sort of listen to it without having our voices over top of it or uh, Matt opening a beverage uh, and uh, disrupting the vibe. So you're able to hear the the track right at the end. And the the song that we're, or the track that we're so showcasing is called Security, which I think is funny based on our theme this week. But then the second reason we're showcasing it is this vinyl. Uh, for those of you that are watching the video uh, version, it's orange and black. It's Halloween today. So I thought this was uh, a perfect, perfect uh, choice for us to have this week. And, you know, it is, it's just a, it's an incredible album. And Matt, I feel like I'm in a real funk and soul exploration phase right now. I, I actually nice, can't nice. get enough. I, I, I find this, the, 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 it's so rich and the albums are so strong. And, uh, so this Mavis, uh, Staples one, um, uh, actually has a lot of familiar tracks. Even if you put it on, there'd be, be songs that are just part of our, 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 our cultural backdrop. Um, son of a preacher man is on this right. album, which if you've, if you're a fan of Pulp Fiction and the soundtrack, uh w from that film that is that's uh, one of the key tracks from that from that uh, movie but anyway how are we going to pair a okay. beverage with mavis staples this week okay so i will say i had a plan joe that that fell through unfortunately i initially so a few weeks ago i got to announce that uh i am i've joined the executive team at rp and i'm i'm vice president of <laughs> So what I had intended to do was, if you've ever been to the Dominican Republic, the beer that's around everywhere there is Presidente. I was hoping I could maybe get one of those <laughs> so I could have alcohol. <laughs> Turn, turns out it's really hard to import that into Canada. So that fell through, unfortunately, for me. So, oh yeah, there we go. What I have this week, um, it's it's a local, to my actual like local in-town brewery. Uh, I'm in a small town, so we've just got the one. Um, it is Lady Friend IPA from Alora Brewing Company. Um, Amazing. Just a, a really good, um, it's one that I think it used to be sort of their fall IPA release. So it, it reminds me nicely like, uh, well, I say fall, but there's snow on the ground for me right now. So uh, maybe we <laughs> skip that. Um, but that's what it feels like for me as a nice fall uh, fall IPA. It's sort of uh, another go-to for me. So I'm, I'm happy and, with And it goes that. along with Mavis, our lady friend today, uh, uh, as our... As yep. a, so it's a great pairing, yeah. great pairing that we have this week. So, okay, <laughs> that's uh, that's pretty that's pretty fun. 
All right. So I think that's it for this week, Matt. Thanks for for joining me. And thanks to our listeners. Uh, Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review. You can find us on Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. And stay connected with us on LinkedIn or by joining our newsletter using the link in the description. And thanks, Mom, for watching as always. Have a great week.